Hello, from the Emirates Literature Foundation in Dubai, this is the Boundless Book Club, the podcast that reminds you that there is a big scary world out there and you can read all about it safely from the comfort of your own home. Today you are here with me, Annabelle. And me, Andrea. We are going to be talking about books set in exceedingly inhospitable locations. In fact, even in places that could kill you. We are going to be joined shortly by the phenomenal Icelandic best-selling author, Ursa Sigurdardóttir. But first, what is the location for your book today and how will it kill you? Ooh. Um, so my location is an unnamed um, country in Western Africa. Uh, we're in the jungle that could you know the jungle could kill you a million ways if it wanted to but also there is um, lots of warring factions different combinations of letters different people trying to um, gain land and I guess power and rights and so on so that is my location what is yours my location is very cold and inhospitable. Um, it is Spitsbergen in 1933. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so all manner of things, namely the, the cold polar bears, uh, just unending darkness and possibility of madness. Um, all, all these things could combine to kill you. Yeah, I actually, I also, as everybody probably knows, I also wanted to read a book set in either Svalbard or, or Greenland or somewhere cold because I love uh, cold, cold books. Yeah. That's a genre. Um, and I actually, I got a recommendation on Twitter from um, an author called uh, Emily Barr, who I've recommended before. Actually, she's written a book called The One Memory of Flora Banks, which is set in Svalbard. But I've already recommended that. The author of that book recommended a book to me called Dark Matter by Michelle Paver. And it sounds absolutely terrifying. It's a 1930s ghost story set in wilderness of the far north. Um, and, uh, and it's they're basically these people on a ship leaving Norway, going north, crossing the Bering Sea by the midnight sun. And... Um, and then they reach this really remote bay where they'll get a camp for a year and then, you know, the perpetual darkness returns. Yeah. And as light leaves, sea freeze, and they find that this particular bay is not uninhabited. There's something out there in the dark. And I don't know if I could bear to read this, but it sounds so amazing. So just uh, getting my Kindle. <laughs> Yes. That sounds brilliant. That also ties in really well to the book that I've just read. And I think what I'm going to do is, because I've got, I've bookmarked so many things, which you can't even really see properly on the screen there. Um, but there is a section where, shall, shall I introduce it properly? How about that? Yeah, do it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> A Woman in the Polar Night by Christian Ritter is essentially a memoir account it's, it's fairly sure it's like 200 and something words it's not it's not as long as i expected it's a an austrian housewife's account of her year in the arctic in this little hut in the middle of nowhere uh in spitsbergen which if you if you haven't got a map in front of you if you're not watching a youtube video where we might put an image of one up hopefully um it is kind of halfway between the North Pole and the tip of Norway. So that's, that's the general area. Very, very cold, um, barren, unforgiving landscape. And she, she, why does she end up in 1933 traveling to the, to the middle of nowhere? She follows her husband, essentially. So her husband went out um, a while ago to travel there and he kind of fell in love with the place and he ended up staying and he wrote to her and he said, come join me. And she's kind of this European housewife. She's used to all the mod cons, um, but she still agrees to go. And she, when like the, the trip there is hilarious because anybody, she, she starts um, the first part of her journey. She starts uh, on this kind of cruise liner so there are a lot of people around her who are enjoying the sights you know they've got their their fancy fur coats and they're looking at her with her massive kind of pack 
um, laden <laughs> down with supplies. Like, what is, who's this mad woman? And she keeps getting stopped by these well-meaning men who are like, you, you, where are you going? No, you're not allowed. We won't let you leave the ship. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not safe. No, 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 no. Um, but she manages to get there because she kind of explains like who her husband is and they're like, oh, we know that guy. He's a good dude. It's fine. You can go. Um, but it, it is hilarious <laughs> how she, she, there are these kind of little pockets of judgment along the way of the, these men going, crazy woman, what are you doing? Go back home to your comfortable home. What are you doing? Well, I would hope she had a comfortable home. Like why did her husband go to set up camp in the wilderness? in Svalbard. You know what, I've kind of forgotten. I think it was work related. <laughs> okay. uh, I was just so obsessed with, not obsessed, I, I was so intrigued by her. And I think that's the, the best thing about this is, one, she's an excellent writer. It was the only book that she, she ever ended up writing. She died at the age of 103. Wow. Um, and the book was immensely popular. Let me find out, this was really interesting actually. Um, let me find. The information while you're while you're looking it up yeah i just want to say as you started talking about this i do feel like a lot of people based here in dubai and in the middle east must be able to relate to this because you know trailing spouses we're all over the place and uh you know familiar with that decision like do i want to leave my entire life because my husband's job is taking him somewhere that i have no connection to hmm. all right then so you know yeah completely relatable Apart from the fact that it was a 30s and no mod cons, I presume. It's a tough existence. And I think what's amazing is just how she takes to it. You know, she's gone from the complete opposite life to this. And it's hilarious how her husband doesn't really talk to her about any of it. He's just like, yes, now we have to, um, now we have to cook the seal carcass, you know. Okay, so she, she's in this hut. It's her husband and her husband's friend, uh, who is kind of a fellow explorer and knows the land very, very well. And she's kind of figuring out what they've got in terms of provisions. And her husband notifies her when she's just arrived. Unfortunately, we haven't any bread yet, my husband apologizes. We'll have to bake some. Stupidly, there wasn't any yeast or any baking powder at the store where we bought our provisions. We'll have to invent some kind of baking powder for this winter. <laughs> invent? I gape at him. How will you invent baking powder? You're not a chemical factory. If it could be invented so easily, we housewives would have invented it long ago. The two men smile placidly. It seems to be a matter of complete indifference to them, whether we have to do without bread for a whole year or not. I am revolted by their equanimity. <laughs> the, the, the whole book is written like this. Uh, there's just kind of these oh. odd snide remarks where she's kind of, she's just eye rolling so hard internally at her husband's just like, well, we'll make do. Oh, well, there's a polar bear outside. Oh, it'll be fine. You <laughs> just, just completely unsympathetic to the fact that she might be a little bit freaked out by some of this. Yeah, it's probably uh, not exactly what she expected from married life. Another, another bit that I wanted to read to you was when she's trying to figure out sleeping arrangements when she's just arrived. A sailor's kit bag is brought in. A yellow silk quilt, bright as a new pin, is spread ceremoniously on one of the bunks. On top of that, with an if you please, is laid a sheepskin sleeping bag. If you please, I have not the first idea how to get inside a sleeping bag. My hat and coat are politely removed and then without hesitation I am lifted up and into the bag and rolled like a joint of meat against the wall. <laughs> uh, oh, fantastic. But yeah, so there's moments like that that are really funny and then other moments of just really beautiful writing about kind of the beauty of the landscape. Yes, it's hostile. Yes, it could very well kill you. Um, but she makes a promise to, before she gets there, to say, I know you've all fallen in love with this place, but I resolutely will not fall in love with it. And, you know, she does. She's completely won over. Right, so when she's asked by her husband in this letter to come all the way to the Arctic to see him and spend a year in a cabin. He tells her that their nearest neighbor, 
an old Swede is in another hut 60 miles away. So it won't be too lonely for you. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he's writing this without any semblance of irony. It's like, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's plenty close. That's lots of yes. company. You'll be we fine. can see them at least every other month or so. It'd yeah. be fine. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I, um, this is not super uh, key to this book, but I also have a funny <clears throat> like misunderstanding husband thing that I've highlighted in my book, um, which is completely different. But the, the, the link here uh, is that both husbands are presumed genius scientists so mm. this is when my main character meets her future husband and they're talking and they kind of haven't known each other for very long. And she asks him about, you know, when he was in the US and what was it like living in California? What's the beach like? And he said, well, you know, I wouldn't know. I was working. I wouldn't do that. Um, why would I want to go to the beach? And she said, well, maybe you'd go for fun. And he goes, listen, I'm 35, time's running out for me. And she laughed at this too long, drink making her a little bit uncontrolled. And then he started to laugh at her, laughing at him. And it wasn't for a long time that she realized that he'd been deadly serious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so I think maybe they had some common ground, these two. Yeah. The husband. But speaking of your book, um, so tell yes. us more about this, this man who thinks that everything's over for him at the age of 35. I know, I know. Bit of pressure. So, so, so my book for today is um, it's Brazzaville Beach by William Boyd, who's one of my, one of my favourite authors, really. Uh, Hope Clearwater is the protagonist and she um, meets, she is telling the story washed up on a beach, Brazzaville Beach, um, in this unnamed state in Africa. And there are two timelines that are kind of unfolding at the same time. One is in England where she meets her husband, the genius mathematician, John Clearwater, mm -hmm. and their life there and the other timeline is happening after the ma after something has gone wrong in England in Africa where she's taken herself off to to this um, reserve where they are watching chimpanzees under this kind of um, this superstar primatologist whose name is Eugene Malabar. He's written a book called The Peaceful Primate, which is about chimpanzees, which is bringing in all the grants and he's got worldwide acclaim for this. But it quite early on in her time there becomes um, apparent to hope that these chimpanzees might not be so peaceful. Um, and then it kind of mirrors, mirrors what's happening in the, in the country at large. And there's always this kind of um, this fairly distant but constant backdrop of fighting that's happening that while they're there isolated in the jungle watching these chimps um, it seems very distant but it's also very present mm. so if you're making that journey from the the from the camp into the local town which is you know several hours away and so on they're lots of army checkpoints and these different factions you don't really know which one is which and who's fighting who but it's constant um and as um as she is making these discoveries about the chimps that obviously has an impact on eugene and his entire project and his funding because people want to hear about the peaceful primate they do not want to hear about chimps that are starting their own civil war within their group. Um, so she um, has a, a lot of conflict. And at one point, the, her life at the camp um, gets uh, disrupted, but because she is, uh, 
just by chance, her and this other fellow researcher are taken by um, one of these warring factions who are very nice and very polite and very, very um, human. Honestly, they're, they're just like, you can, you really see the humanity in these poor p fighters who are there with their big guns and, um, you know, trying to achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. We can't even tell anymore. There's fighting in every part of this country. And she happens to be caught up by these particular ones. And, uh, and she's with this other researcher. And I want to read this this little piece to you that kind of illustrates a, the juxtaposition of everything that, that where he is, Ian, the other researcher is going kind of, he's losing his mind, basically, wondering what is going on and thinking that everything is, they're gonna die. But their captors are really very polite. They're charming to them, that he's the, the leader of this group is kind of, um, very conversationally saying, oh, maybe I shouldn't have taken you, but you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> now I'm sorry, but I have to take you with me to where we're going because I can't drop you off anywhere else. But you know, I'm sure we'll, I'll probably let you go once we get there, it'll be fine. But Ian is freaking out and he's saying to Hope, he's going, look what they've got written on their jackets, atomic boom. What the hell does that signify? Some kind of commando, some kind of death squad? He was properly beginning to panic. For Christ's sake, I stood up. The two boys were lounging at the fringe of the shade cast by the mango tree. They're talking quietly to each other, their weapons on the ground, their backs half turned away from us. I walked over to them. I pointed to the tracksuit top. What does this mean? I asked. Atomic boom. Volley, he smiled. I'm sorry. It's our game. We play volleyball. We're the team Atomic Boom. So that just shows how like they're these completely like innocent teenagers who play yeah. volleyball in their normal life. They're just like a team who happen to get live in an area where they got drafted into this this fighting. And um and it's just it's it's a phenomenal story. Uh, and it's it's Compared to some literature that I, I really like to read quite sparse prose, but this is just like, this is maximalist. There's so much going on. There's so much amazing description and so many, um, so many characters that all have their own particular feel and smell and, and expressions. And it's just, it's really wonderful. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's um, the, the different parts of Hope's life that are just becoming unveiled. And it's really interesting because I thought this book was about Hope and her life, but I read a review of it in The New Scientist. Mm. Um, and they claim the book is about science and the emotional impact research has on its researcher. So there you go. Um, that is a, a different take on on what the book is, and they are they were very pleased because it presents science in a, in a, or and scientists in quite a good light. Apart from the fact that um, the husband John Clearwater is completely unraveling by the fact that he hasn't made the discoveries he should have made, and time is running out. Because as you come into your late thirties statistically apparently scientists do not deliver groundbreaking s discoveries so much anymore so they really go. um that is a fact i believe that most groundbreaking discoveries are made by people who are younger and then they might develop those as they get older right um yeah and sobering. it's very well written huh that's sobering well, it would be if if you were a scientist. Oh, before we bring in Ursa, I wanted to just read the bit that you reminded me of when you started talking about Michelle Paver. What was it called? Yeah. The ghost story. Um, the uh, dark matter. Dark matter. So I've talked about, I've read out a few excerpts of kind of the fun bits of this book. 
And you talked about sparse prose being something that you like. And I think that's why you all really like this. So the Arctic is described beautifully, but it, not, not a, she never uses more words than absolutely necessary. It's kind of like the, everything is bare bones, her experience, they have the, what they need to survive. And she uses only the words needed to describe her experience. And I think that's also why it's so short. But there, there is one bit where they are kind of going on a, she joins them on a hunting trip, which is not normal. So normally she's at home and they go off and hunt, but she joins them this time. And they arrive at kind of this, this hut to rest in. And <laughs> she remarks, the hut has the reputation of having brought misfortune on every expedition. Death and scurvy have their stubborn habitation here. One woman who had spent the winter here died in the boat on the homeward journey, and a member of an important scientific expedition had left his frozen big toe here. Here, through this hole in the roof, a bear was once shot in the winter night. To my immense disgust, the hut is considered to be quite fit for an overnight stay during the winter. An overnight stay, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> So you get, a, you get a sense there that despite the kind of fun elements of it and her remarking on the beauty of the landscape every now and then, it, like she always brings it back to the fact that people have died. No one knows yes. we're here. This could end badly. Yeah. It's amazing that it didn't. Um, since you brought us back to cold weather prose, I do want to mention one more book, if I'm allowed. Yes. Um, Yes, it's, it's um, a book I really wanted to read for this episode, but I didn't um, manage to get my hands on it. It's called An African in Greenland, and I will really struggle to pronounce the, the name of this author. It's Tete Michel Kpumasi, or something similar to that, um, who was this teenager in Togo, who discovered a book about Greenland and just, just felt instinctively that he must go there. Um, and then he was working his way north over nearly a decade until he arrived there. And then it's about um, his experience meeting the Inuits in Greenland and the, finding the, I guess, the common ground with these people from completely, completely different worlds. Um, I imagine being from Togo, he had never been cold in his life. And, you know, the people, the Inuit people in Greenland have typically not traveled very much. So I imagine they probably would not have met an African before he arrived there. Um, so, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to get my hands on that and read that. It would be absolutely astounding. Um, and again, that's nonfiction, just like yours. That sounds amazing. I think it would be really cool to read A Woman in the Polar Night, Dark Matter by Michelle Paver, you know, fiction break, then come back to An African in Greenland, and then uh, Brazzaville Beach. Yes, to okay. just to warm up after you've yeah, been cold. Yeah, to warm up after yes. you've been cold. For um, and on that note, I think we should bring in Ursa. We're now joined by Ursa Sagudadote. Ursa is a prolific writer and civil engineer with both children's books and dark crime fiction to her name. She made her crime fiction debut in 2005 with Last Rituals and has been translated into more than 30 languages. The Silence of the Sea won the Petrona Award in 2015. Gallows Rock is her 13th adult novel and the fourth in the Freya and Huldar series. She joins us from Reykjavik, Iceland. And when we emailed you, Ursa, to invite you to join us on the podcast. You had just had an earthquake there. I hope there are no more signs of earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. How, how's that doing? That is just plodding on. Everyone is expecting an eruption soon, mm. but uh, apparently it's not gonna be a really bad one. It's more what we call like a tourist eruption. <laughs> tourist eruption. Yeah, what is that? Tourist eruption. A tourist eruption doesn't disrupt anything and doesn't go. You know, um, it's it's just beautiful lava. No airlines have to cancel anything, and 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 it's not disturbing. You know, people's livelihoods and homes. That's okay. a tourist eruption. Yeah. 
So it's like an attraction for tourists rather yes. than it's yes. being a tourist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we're kind of hoping it waits until flights are, are back on because this is actually quite close to the airport. So, so that would be like a, a really good selling point for, for Iceland and tourism. <laughs> Okay, well, fingers crossed for the tourist eruption then. Yeah, there you go. Um, this is all quite fitting because we invited you to this episode specifically uh, to talk about the places that will kill you because we were thinking of the dark atmospheric settings of your stories. Um, but it seems that Iceland wanted to show off first before we spoke to you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, I think we, we really wanted to talk to you um, about was obviously the fact that your, your crime novels are dark in themselves, but they're also set in a setting that is kind of quite dark. And I think the, the first thing that it would be great to get your thoughts on is kind of how, how that works when you're kind of including a landscape like that in a genre that's already quite dark. Yeah, it's... Uh... I think, I mean, setting has so much to do with setting the atmosphere of a novel. Um, and so, so, so for one thing, there's such a difference between uh, Icelandic landscape and, and, and the setting between, for example, summer and winter, because we have these really, really bright summer nights and very, very dark winters. So one of the things that I found that I do is, is I tend to set my books in the winter when it's dark because that somehow seems more fitting when you're writing about uh, awful things and creepy things. So, so that for one, I, I tend to do not really knowingly, it just happens. And, and then uh, a part of sort of invoking fear or uneasiness, uh, one of the things, that helps a lot is, is like isolation uh, and, and, and for example, nature, Icelandic nature is quite, uh, it can be very um, dangerous, I guess would be the word, or, or, you know, you have to realize that you're a person that's not actually made for, for uh, living unaided in, in Icelandic nature. So, yeah. so, so that does help a lot to, to sort of, I don't know, set the scene, I guess, make the atmosphere such that you, you know bad things are going to be happening. They happen in the beginning and they're going to keep happening through to the end of the book. If, sorry, I have a question about all the bad things that happen in your book. Um, you, Iceland is actually extraordinarily safe, isn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, it do, is. <laughs> so do you find, where do you find inspiration for these incredibly dark and and um horrific stories yeah i i think even though we're safe uh, part of that is to, has to do also with how small the community is we're only three hundred fifty thousand people so so it's it's easier to keep control of uh crime and also because we're so small we don't have uh like gangs and syndicated crime very much, very little of that. And that is probably where most violence in countries occurs. So because of this, um, we don't have very much young men killing young men in gang related wars or, or, or some crime, uh, crime related uh, wars or things like that. And as a result, uh, Icelandic women are killed as much as men because when you take that away, Icelandic people are no different from other people where, where anger and hate and so on uh, uh, makes people do bad things. So we are lucky in the, in the respect that we can take away sort of the, the, the crime and gang related murders and we, we still have murders, but fewer. And then usually uh, the, it's, it's between people that know each other. So, so, so that's probably why we have fewer murders than, than most countries, I think. So, so you do, there are reasons to kill. There are murders that take place here. They're just fewer than in larger societies. And what about that kind of small community angle on say the detectives in your books who are then having to like investigate these crimes? Um, 
do they kind of like the, everybody knows everybody's business so the people that they go to interview do they they pretty much know everybody already <laughs> it, it is sometimes it's when, when you're writing sometimes this uh, uh these very few degrees of separation between everyone sometimes it's it's difficult but you have to just find a way to use it to your advantage and i and i think writing about things that might seem really ridiculously coincidental in a bigger country would actually be something that could occur here but it is also difficult because keeping a secret is more is harder i think but we do have some advantages one of them being uh, for example like like in london and big cities for example there's a lot of uh cctv cameras following you around and they can sort of trace where somebody went and that so on we have much much less of that so so that does you know that that's the benefit and then the the minus is that um yeah it's 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 people are more closely related and, and know each other than than what you would usually see in in bigger cities and and as a result i don't think anyone here could I mean, you couldn't write about um, like a serial killer who kills at random and has done it for 10 years without anybody realizing. I mean, that would not happen here. A serial killer, you know, on, on victim number two, he would be, you know, they would realize, oh, oh, oh something's going on. <laughs> something's going on. <laughs> yeah. That's um, fascinating. Um, I think that the last time that I spoke to you, I was probably mentioning how traumatized I was because I, I just read The Legacy um, and I was having trouble, um, obviously, looking at my vacuum cleaner for a very long time. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I just wanted to let you know that I'm over that now. It's taken okay. some time. Yeah. <laughs> but Got that's very all good. dusty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've just started reading uh, Gallows Rock, which I think is the, the latest one that's out in, in English, I believe. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, and I, I, I love the way that that starts with somebody like, it's, it's the perfect example of this really forbidding landscape and these lava fields, um, combined with like a gruesome act of violence. Yeah. 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 Um, but I wanted to ask like, if you, if you're constantly sitting and wondering about more horrific ways for your characters to die. Yeah. No, I, I, that series, the first one with the vacuum cleaner murder, and then the second one is is quite uh, also like the murders are pretty horrific. And and I did think after those two books, where am I heading with this? You know, am I going to constantly think of more creepy ways to kill people, and and what what will that do to me as a person and a writer to to constantly trying to outdo myself with gruesomeness? So I did take a step back. And, and and tone down sort of the the uh, the novelty murders, I guess you would say. So 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 as not to go because it's a slippery slope. If if you always have to be more awful, more horrible, then you end up just being some creepy, I don't know, torture porn writer or something. So 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 I I uh, I did tone that back a little bit. There 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 the murders are. Obviously, like every murder, they're not cute or nice. They're, they're they're awful, but but they're not. I did kind of try to go back up a little bit with with the uh, uh, the gruesomeness, I guess. And also, maybe one thing to be said about about writing murders and and how the that it, it depends on are you writing, uh, are you describing in great detail the murder itself, or are you describing the aftermath when somebody comes and sees what has happened? And I think. Mm. I think you can you can describe um, like awful murders in a way better and with more um, uh, what do you say what would be the word not grace but with more uh, um, less like uh, all, yeah less not no less impact but less gruesomeness I guess or or or, uh, or voyeurism if it, if it's just being seen afterwards then and you don't have to describe things in in i mean you don't have to follow every blood drop as it splashes on the wall because the reader can fill in the blanks so, so the strongest 
descriptions of such things would be the ones that don't really include a lot of detail, I find. Yeah, because we're filling in quite a lot as a reader with our own imagination, yeah. and that's sometimes more horrific than being told yeah. everything. Yes, exactly. So. <laughs> and I'm in a really good mood today because yesterday my book that came out last year won the Icelandic Crime Novel Award. So, congratulations! So wow, <laughs> congratulations! That's amazing. Yeah, so that was really nice. Oh, I'm sorry Which to mention that, that? In the introduction. Oh, sorry. That one is. Uh, that one is called The Prey. Okay. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a, like a crime ghost dish story that takes place in the highlands. And, and yeah, it, it's, it's good. It's good. Really creepy. Yeah. Ooh. I, I've, I've got a question about ghosts actually, but um, I feel like I'm, I'm hogging the mic here, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I just think it's really interesting. And, um, and I think there's something about the setting with those really dark nights in, and the desolate landscape. I, I, I mean, it's fantastic for this, this topic, I think. Um, yeah, it I, it's also because, because of this, uh, it's, it's when you live in a city, you know, your neighbor is, is, there's always somebody really close by to kind of seek out help if you're, yeah, but isolation is when you stand on your own two feet and you don't have all the uh, the remedy or, or the or the, uh, uh, the chances to seek help or, 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 or find somebody else to just hang on to when someone's chasing you. That's, a, a, I think, a fear that we all have inside, to be alone somewhere in the dark with somebody chasing us or someone. That's, that's, and I, I sometimes use that when I'm, when I'm writing, like what, when I'm starting a book, like what would I absolutely not want to happen to me or somebody that I, I uh, love and that's a lot of stuff <laughs> then you get lots of ideas <laughs> so do you um, do you spend much time in nature I, I do not not as much as I would like to but I do yeah and I always go when I'm writing I, I have to go to the place and stay a little bit in the locations that I'm writing about because although there's lots of information available on the internet and in books and so on it's never the same as being being in the location and, and sort of having the 3d experience and and you know finding the smells hearing the sounds and so on so so i do try to you know get somehow a, a realistic feeling for the place to be able to describe it well and so on so and whenever you go hiking or or go for a day trip somewhere do you think this would be a lovely spot for a murder <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> absolutely and uh, you know especially when i'm when i finish the book and i'm looking for what i'm going to do next then then i walk around like a spotter you know I'm, I'm i'm constantly thinking and looking for things that that would be uh for me both interesting and and, and creepy yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. See the trees behind you, Andrea. One of the yes. things. One of the things that I, I there's a huge difference, for example, between uh, books and, and culture uh, Icelandic is that we don't have forests. We have very very few trees. We have trees that have been planted, and and you see in in, in like for example uh, books from from England and places where there are lots of trees that the forest holds some sort of uh, you know, kids are scared of the forest. You get get lost in the woods and all, all of that stuff. We don't have, so we have um, like like the rocks and then the ocean. I mean, those two things would be our forests in a way to to be afraid of and 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 have things you know where something horrible can happen. That that would be uh, going close to the ocean or, or or being in a lava field where the rocks take on uh, all sorts of in the dark you know they can look like trolls and and whatever but but fear of a forest we don't have because we don't have any forest they say if you get lost in an icelandic forest just stand up and then <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you were to go um 
you know, you, you're writing a new book and you've got a character who's gone for a hike. What's the worst thing that would happen to them from the environment? Is it getting lost among yeah. big rocks? It's getting lost. Um, it Falling is into a lava. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could fall down, uh, fall down into something. You could, you know, break a leg and not be able to get back because our even our summers can be tough. Uh, you know, you wouldn't survive in just a, uh, a, a t-shirt uh, through a, a long time in the highlands, for example, uh, if you were uh, got lost or stuck and and so on. And then in the winter, of course, you know, you're just doomed, you know, if you're, if you're uh, lost alone outside in, in, in the winter, that's, that's not a good thing. So, so that would be our, uh, yeah, our forest. I feel like we should rename this episode Survival Tips with us. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. It's all for today. Thank you so much, Usa. It's been absolutely lovely speaking to you. And um, thanks for tuning in to the Boundless Book Club. We are back again in two weeks time when we're going to be speaking about Ramadan, which is happening soon. Um, so we'll be talking about the books that you should be reading and the things you should be thinking about. And until then, if you want to send us any comments or suggestions, you can drop us an email on comms at emrislitfest.com or send us a message on social media. That's all for today. Thank you so much. Take care. Halas. <laughs> <laughs>